Hello, welcome to our next presentation on the management of hepatic encephalopathy. Hepatic encephalopathy is a serious neuropsychiatric complication of liver disease and it carries significant mortality and morbidity. It would come to no surprise to you that survival is very poor after onset of hepatic encephalopathy, with a one year survival of, of around 40% and a three year survival of around 20%. Moreover, up to 50% of admissions of patients with cirrhosis to hospital is related to hepatic encephalopathy. I think it's best for us to illustrate the management by talking through a case. Mr. X is a 55 year old gentleman with a background of alcoholic cirrhosis, recurrent ascites, known varices. He was independent, working as a plumber. As medication, he was taking thiamine and vitamin B, which are supplements that all patients with liver cirrhosis should be on, furosemide for the ascites, amyloride for the ascites, which, and it also helps with countering the loss of potassium from furosemide, lactulose for hepatic encephalopathy, we'll discuss that later, and propanolol, which is a very good prophylaxis for varices. His main problem when he presented to clinic was tiredness and an in-depth history revealed that the tiredness was associated with diurnal variation, reversal of sleep-wake pattern, generalized slowness and his examination findings were as shown on the slide. Investigations confirmed a coarse liver with a blood picture highly suggestive of cirrhosis so I'd agree that the albumin is a bit higher than you'd expect. Well, uh, I'm pretty sure you'd agree that this gentleman has hepatic encephalopathy and he has more of a chronic type of hepatic encephalopathy. Mr. Rex is also very young, potentially has some good productive was working years ahead of him if managed properly. And this brings us to the management modalities of hepatic encephalopathy. I've taken this table from a paper whose reference is available at the end and it summarizes the tripartite strategy when managing somebody with hepatic encephalopathy both in the acute and chronic setting. First of all I'll draw you to the first set of boxes and it's very important to rule out any other causes of encephalopathy. Look out for hypoxia, hypercapnia, acidosis and all of these can be easily investigated for an arterial blood gas. All patients should also have their urea and electrolyte checked to look for any evidence of uremia or electrolyte imbalance. In the acute setting, to counter the effects of the latter, uh, to counter the effects of later developing Wernicke Korsakoff syndrome, as most of these patients tend to have poor nutrition, an intravenous mixed high potency concentrate can be administered. In the UK we use Pabrinex. Patients with chronic hepatic encephalopathy can also have oral vitamin B and thiamine as in our case. If there is any evidence of head injury, a head scan would be needed. Blood glucose levels need to be checked as well due to the possibility of impaired gluconeogenesis leading to hypoglycemia. The second box covers the triggers and it's important to rule out these triggers. Infection is a common trigger and a full septic screen needs to be done. A careful history examination and a complete blood count should help you rule out any evidence of GI bleed. Non-absorbable disaccharides like lactulose can be used to treat constipation. The hypothesis is that if we manage to clear out ammonia enterically, less will accumulate in the astrocytes of the brain. Traditionally, traditionally lactulose has been used as first-line therapy. The doses need to be adjusted to achieve two to three loose motions per day. In the acute setting, patients with grade 3 or 4 hepatic encephalopathy, intubation needs to be considered for appropriate management. Whilst dietary protein overload is a theoretical risk factor, it's also important to recognize that a lot of liver patients are malnourished. Hence, a sensible middle ground needs to be achieved. Vegetable and dairy sources of protein are preferable to animal protein. 
Treatment of hepatic encephalopathy itself is based on the principle of reducing the production and absorption of ammonia. We've already covered how lactulose can be used. It can be administered both orally and or nasogastrically, but also through enemas rectally. As we've said, the aim is to produce two to three soft bowel motions per day. Lactulose, however, has some side effects, including diarrhea, nausea, electrolyte imbalance. And at times you reach a plateau as to how far you can push with lactulose. Some antibiotics have been shown to be useful when treating hepatic encephalopathy. Neomycin was one of the first antibiotics to be used. It reduces ammonia production in the enteric system but also has significant side effects, which includes autotoxicity and nephrotoxicity. Metronidazole has also been used, but prolonged use of two to three weeks can cause peripheral neuropathy and other neurotoxicities. Some centers are now using rifaximin with good results. Rifaximin is an antibiotic license for treatment of traveler's diarrhea in the USA. It has very little systemic absorption. It has been shown to be beneficial in patients with minimal hepatic encephalopathy. Patients with large spontaneous portosystemic shunts may have increased incidence of hepatic encephalopathy. Such collaterals may be visualized on ultrasound or via angiographic techniques and can be subsequently coiled up angiographically. This has been shown to reduce the incidence of hepatic encephalopathy. Patients who have had the transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt, otherwise known as the TIPS procedure, can also develop hepatic encephalopathy as a recognized complication. Such patients need to be considered for transplantation or if they are not considered fit enough candidates should be considered for shunt reversal. Even those who haven't had TIPS procedure are now increasingly being considered for liver transplantation after first incidence of hepatic encephalopathy. This is even more so when medical therapy reaches a plateau. To conclude, let's find out what we did to our patient. Well, he was started on neomycin, but as to be expected, he developed autotoxicity after around a month. This was swapped to metronidazole, but again, he developed significant peripheral neuropathy, and with his job being a plumber, he c this wasn't an option in the long term. Finally, he was tried on rifaximin with good results. He's now back at work, and tiredness is less of an issue for him. I've left you with some further resources for further study. Thanks, we'd be grateful for your feedback.